we are recording on a Sunday, a rainy Sunday, which is sort of a lovely time to record. It really is. That's why I'm wearing yeah. a sweatshirt. It felt cozy. It felt right, you know? Yeah. I oh, know. What's that? Have you seen the episode? You were never really an office person, huh? No, but I could chat. You <laughs> just throw it out there. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. <laughs> It's like an episode where like anytime it's rain, it rains, Phyllis has the same things that she says. We're like, I just like to snuggle up with a cold book, cold book, or it's ready to get, no, this is, this is, um, this isn't getting anywhere. But also what's a cold book? Like, no, I, was, no, I was like snuggling up on a rainy cold day with a good book, oh, right? Like, or she's like, it's raining cats and dogs out there. And they like do this game in the office where they try to see how many times they can get her to say it. Honestly, um, I, every time I see The Office, I really like it. I just it like is, haven't, I don't sit down and like watch it. And I really, I feel like I that's have a good watched thing to do. The Office all the way through oh. five times. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> I thought you were going to stop there. And that's one of the least embarrassing ones I've, re- I've watched all the way through. Like Lost, I've watched all the way through twice. I fucking love Lost. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm obsessed with loss honestly third season fourth season like got a little nuts oh it was so bad it but was that's so all bad. shows the ending of all shows you're like please that was shameless i was like you guys need to end this and yet i i will watch till the end anything yep same yep. i mean listen lost i don't think that's embarrassing i am a huge crusader for lost <laughs> all right well listen in subways tv is my distress tolerance and we're going to talk a little bit today about distress tolerance skills what they are how we build them but first we have a listener question Maya wrote in, if you played pro baseball, what would your walk-up song be? First, let me say, I clearly don't watch pro baseball because I have (laughs) no idea they had a walk-up song. Did you? (laughs) I thought that's where the whole, like, okay, like, we're Philadelphia. Like, I, oh, no, never mind. I thought that's where the whole, like, dancing on my own. I think that's when they went. That was the locker room song. I Yeah. yeah, I thought it was. I got, as soon as I started singing, I was like, no, that's wrong. Yeah. So what would my song be? I have no idea. <laughs> and like you would be, yours would be like Alanis Morissette where you're just crying. Yes. And I would be like grungy emo walking up. Actually, that's a great. That I is think it's great... supposed to be like a pump up to your best self. And for you, that is truly depressing. That is, Alanis it's like emo. It's like emo punk, maybe like a punk yeah. emo music, you yeah. know, some sort um, of 90s, 90s hit. What about I mean, you? Right now, it would be culturally appropriate and significant to say murder on the dance floor. Oh, yeah. The murder on the dance that, floor. That gets me amped up. And it better not kill the groove. DJ. <laughs> you know, that's what I would say would be appropriate for now. But I, I am one of those people who, like, my favorite music changes, like, every second. Like, or the next day. Me too. I, I'm not one who, like, sticks to one yes. thing. Same season. Over and over again, you know? I'm a I random feel... Spotify playlist girl. Me too. And that's how I discover music. So Me I would too. say I'll take any of those. But great question. Good question. And we're going to think on it more. We'll think on it. Okay. But we're going to talk today about distress tolerance skills. We have talked a little bit about distress tolerance before. We're going to talk a little bit about where distress tolerance comes from. So essentially, distress tolerance is like the ability to manage actual or perceived emotional distress and the reason why i'm going to make sure we really talk about the perceived emotional distress is often we need to utilize distress tolerance skills for things that aren't actually real and we're talking a little bit more about that in terms of like reality checking and things but basically um a dialectical behavioral therapy is the theory that really really does db does distress tolerance work it was developed by Marsha Linehan in the 1970s and it incorporates skills around emotional regulation, behavior modification, mindfulness, and interpersonal awareness. And so if you were someone that you listened to today's episode and you're like, shit, I really need some of these skills, find yourself a DBT therapist. There are DBT groups um, all over the place. Search for DBT. That would be where you want to go if you want to improve this. I, how do you think your, like, I'm thinking about distress tolerance for myself. How do you think your distress tolerance is now compared to where it was when you were younger? Oh my God. A million times better. I mean, even for me, I feel like when I think back to like 15 years ago, (laughs) bad, (laughs) bad, same, so bad. But also it was how my, so basically the other thing is for distress tolerance skills is basically, um, how do I not (laughs) self-sabotage? The ability to do distress tolerance skills is how do I handle situation without making it worse? Mm. For me, 15 years ago, 
I would simply make the situation worse, right? Yeah. So let's say I had a perceived abandonment wound for somebody. Everyone's hanging out without me. Um, the way I would make this worse is by being rude and passive aggressive to people because I didn't actually have skills in terms of vulnerability, right? So that is not a healthy distress tolerance skills. That's self-sabotaging yeah. and relational damage. I think, you know, I was driving over, I'm in the, I'm recording in the office right now. It's raining. I'm in Philly. It's hard to park in Philly. And, you know, I was behind very slow drivers because it's raining and, you know, people always struggle in the rain. And I was thinking, because I was like, okay, I got to prep for this episode in my head. And I was thinking about the fact that like, it was giving me anxiety to be behind these slow drivers. Mm. And like, it was really building up within me. If that was me 15 years ago, I would have been freaking out, like yeah, freaking out. And, and, you know, when I think about the kind of self-sabotage piece of it, I would start getting very stressed and I would, my stress would turn into all of these like catastrophic thoughts in my head and I wouldn't be able to go deeper into them. I wouldn't be able to pull myself out of them. Um, a lot of the the thinking would be, okay, I'm going to be late. I'm not going to be able to get this done. We have a time crunch, right? It, it kind of stays on the top layer of the anxiety. Um, and so my distress tolerance in those moments was like, okay, if I'm late, I will just call Emily. We'll talk about it. It will be, you know, like you take yourself into kind of these worst case scenario thoughts that are coming up for you. Um and it allows you to, it at least allows me to self-soothe in those moments in ways that I was never able to self-soothe in the past. And I think when we stay on the top layer of our anxiety, of our stress, of everyone's going to, everyone hates me, everyone's going to abandon me, I'm going to be late for this, um, this is all going to fall apart. And we don't take ourselves into that to start to ask ourselves questions about some of that kind of catastrophic thinking that comes up. Um it keeps us in that kind of fight or flight mode. And when we're in that fight or flight mode, our body reacts to it and it becomes cyclical in a lot of ways. And so your ability to take yourself into it and then say, okay, well, if this were to happen, I here is how I would handle it. I would actually be able to get through it in this way. It's going to be okay. Um, but I think 15 years ago, I was not able to do that. And then it would just become completely cyclical. Yeah. Um, um well, someone had written in, let's, let's go this. So somebody had written in, why is this so uncomfortable? There was a part of what DBT talks about in terms of building stress on skills, where they talked about um, reality acceptance skills. One of the reasons why this shit is so uncomfortable is a lot of times reality often sucks to accept. <laughs> so let's imagine a situation where you feel someone in your life pulling away. And instead of confronting it head on, because you can feel it, you um, try to hang out with them all the time or you try to keep going towards them, right? The reason it's so distressing is because it's very hard to accept the reality that maybe this person needs a break from you or maybe this person is going through their own shit or maybe it is something that you did. And so these things could go together. So it's so fucking uncomfortable to sit in distress because even though it feels... um you know, like you're demonstrating some pick me energy by keeping going towards this other person, you, you can feel it, right? You can feel this fucking energetic thing that's happening and you really want to avoid it. That's when we get into what we say is, is the self-sabotage part of it. I think we also can feel something that's like out of our control, right? Like this person's pulling away and like I have, and we try to gain control over something that's actually out of our control. And when we try to gain uh, control over something that's out of our control, we continue to feel more and more out of control, right? It like, once again, it becomes this like ball of discomfort and, and we keep trying to grasp at something that we can't grasp and it builds and builds and builds within us. I mean, it's this, you know, I keep going back to traffic because that's the thing that really gets me. It's the same thing with traffic, right? It builds this discomfort within you, but you have no control over that traffic. Mm -hmm. You can't get out of there. You can't make it go faster. You can't, but your distress is that you can't take control of it. You can't make it move. You can't. And so to be able to navigate your own internal world in those moments is so important. 
Can I tell you something really funny about this as we're talking about traffic? Okay, so I drive my daughter the same way to school every single way. And the way that I drive her sucks. There's a million red lights. The traffic is super fucking bad. My daughter gets unbelievably car sick. It's a really, it's a shit show every morning because her school's 20, like 20 like minutes away. Okay. On Friday, yesterday, uh, what day is it? Two days ago, yes. we had this open house. And we're having this open house in our office and my car was packed with like a million things. And I packed, we have like two SUVs. I packed a smaller one that Millie, that is the one that Millie typically gets car sick in. Cause I'm thinking like, oh, Aaron's going to take her for the day. I'll take the small, small car. Okay. In the morning she was like, can you please drive me to school? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'll drive you to school. Not a problem, but we have to take the small car. She's like, oh, I hate the small car. I always get car sick. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. And then I was like, you want to know what? Why don't we just take the highway? <laughs> It's three minutes longer, so I never take it because that's never what Waze tells me to take. It was lovely. It ended up... (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, like, I basically, in my head before with this other route, was like, oh, I'll leave early or I'll do this, or here's all the ways I tried to, like, navigate this. And then I accepted, this is a shitty way to fucking drive that's not working out for anyone here. I'm just going to take the longer way. It was lovely. (laughs) Are you going to take it more often now? Yeah, never taking the shitty way again. I don't care that it's a few minutes longer. It was right, so matter. much better. Oh, you weren't seeing the traffic. I wasn't worried and very because I was getting anxious that she gets car sick, all these things. Lovely. And at the end of the way, I said, How do you feel? She said, I feel fine. That was great. The highway. The highway's the move. So one part is the giving up of control. Mm-hmm. Which I know is horrible. Somebody wrote in and said, um, um, My whole life, if I worked hard enough, I got what I wanted. Now I'm struggling to conceive. How do I accept that it isn't something I can control? There's a lot of shit in life we can control. And if you are someone that has done well by using control um, to be a wonderful tool for you, which you can do, right? Like if you, I use like organization and control like very well to help my life. And then life hits you in the fucking face and you don't have it anymore what's your backup plan what other tool do we have besides control and often that's what we have to learn in a horrible thing like infertility accepting that it's not something control is a long journey especially when people around you are controlling it or there's also just so much information um you know when i started meeting with my ivf doctor i was like all right I was someone who did like all this stuff, right? Like to the acupuncture and the supplements. And I like went in, I, Jen, I told you the story and I'm like, okay, here's what I'm taking. Here's all the stuff I'm doing. And he like literally looks at me and he's like, that's sweet. Like, he's <laughs> like, you fucking dumbass. Like, this thing's so- <laughs> like I'm oh, like, this- I know. He was like, bless your heart. <laughs> he was like, bless your heart. And then he was like, you need science. You have severe infertility. You are driving yourself crazy thinking this is something you can control but you have the world's worst egg quality. So then I'm like, okay, well, what can I do to improve it? What other supplements can I do with stuff? And he looks at me and he goes, there's nothing you can do to improve it. And there's nothing you did to cause it, but you can blame your mom if you want. And I said, sure, no problem. I'm a therapist. We'd love to do that. (laughs) Happy to do that. But the messaging I really got from him in that moment was like, I know that you're trying to do this, but like there is sometimes a limit of what you can do before you need science's help. Mm-hmm. And I tried all the other stuff and the other stuff works for you. That is so great and wonderful. But I think also it makes us feel really bad when we tell women, do this. Have you tried this? Have you tried this? When sometimes they just need fucking science. I think too, like even other people are, it's hard for other people to see you in distress or see. And so yes. their attempt is to say, well, why don't you try to control it in this way or try to control it in this way? Because we have a hard time also sitting in other people's distress. Yeah. Right. So actually, you know, our distress tolerance skills also come in to play when we are sitting with other people who are in distress because it brings up our own distress Mm -hmm. and the way in which we try to control it is say, okay, I'm going to help you fix this. I'm going to fix this for you. Really what you're doing is trying to say, well, I am uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable sitting in your distress right now. I don't have my own distress tolerance skills. And so the way that I am going to manage my own distress is to try to fix this for you, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And 
bless your heart <laughs> because you are trying. <laughs> You care so much about yes. your friends, whoever, about, right? I mean, like your intentions are incredible. Yeah. However, I mean, the amount of people I had that would say to me like, oh, have you tried this like hormone hacking thing? Or like, yeah. have you read this book and all this stuff? And you're like, okay, like, thanks so much. I have no bandwidth for any of this. I want to try 24 hours a day. And the thing no one had said to me that I am now very clear to say to someone is that like, I fucking love science. And, <laughs> and actually- Giving into the full medical part and science of it was one of the most empowering things I've ever done. Mm. Also, I made it so far. It was like, oh, well, that's so expensive to do fertility treatment. And then I was spending a gajillion dollars on all the other woo-woo bullshit right. I was doing. And I was like, I should have just done this shit from the beginning and saved myself the time. And money. Well, also, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in that process of like relinquishing yourself to science, you had to give up so much of your own control. I mean, my whole schedule that. too. You're, that's, You're there that all is the time. A, right. Your schedule, like completely relinquishing and Jen, your Jen, schedule. How far ahead do I look at my schedule? <laughs> uh, so far ahead. Like I it plan- is <laughs> so like out of your comfort zone to do that. Mm-hmm. And you really gave into it, even yeah. though like the, tra- you know, like everything that yeah. you had to do where they're just like, you come in today, you come in today. Like they have complete control over your schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and they change your medicine like every other day. Like it is a really crazy process when you're going through an egg retrieval um, to prep for IVF. And so it is like I am someone that has used the skill of control to help in many ways. The issue is it cannot be the only distress tolerance skill I have. Mm-hmm. And so I think it could be helpful for us to talk about some other ones maybe. Yes. Okay. Um. Uh, so let's go off this example. Uh, somebody had said how to deal with discomfort or distress when a partner confronts you with an issue and to not go into defensive programming. Oof. DBT talks about something very helpful, which is the STOP skill. And so what this stands for is STOP, literally S, stop whatever it is you're the fucking midst of doing. Just fucking stop. <laughs> okay? T, take a step back. Once you have stepped back and taken that step back from your emotions, widen your perspective to include the entire whole picture, not just your emotions at the moment. The O is observe. Take a moment to notice your body. Observe your feet planted on the floor. Fucking ground yourself. And P is the proceed mindfully. Once you have done all the other ones, you take a breath and you proceed with the situation at hand and the capacity for which you need to or must. Okay. So let's go through that again, right? So S-T-O-P. Stop everything you're doing. Take a step back. Observe. Proceed mindfully. Those skills alone are very helpful when someone else is coming at you when you're in relational situations. I feel like we should have been taught this instead <laughs> of like stop, drop, and roll, you know, like that oh, idea. No, that also might be helpful. <laughs> But like, could we just how teach often, both instead of how often are people spontaneously catching on fire? Just tell well, me. as you know, my guilty pleasure TV show right now is nine one one about firefighters. So I'm currently very into fire safety. <laughs> I said to Aaron, I was like, I was like, we don't have. If we thought about our two different routes to leave the house. He's like, what the fuck? Let me tell you something. My and this is like, I'm going to tell you where part of my anxiety comes from. <laughs> when I was younger, my parents and this was, you know, it was probably really helpful to do this when you have kids. My parents would do a fake fire drill late at night. They would have me and my brother crawl on the ground out of our beds, <laughs> down the stairs. They would go, woo. And we would crawl <laughs> out of our beds, down the stairs. We, all of us had those like ladders in our bedroom. Hey, and I hate this and love this. I, th- you know, they wonder <laughs> why I was so terrified of like natural disasters or like things happening to the house oh and when it was I probably said this on the podcast before that when it was lightning we would have to wear rubber shoes and go down to the basement <laughs> did I tell you that before wait didn't your house actually get hit my by house lightning actually once? got hit by lightning yeah so did the rubber shoes come after or before the lightning let me tell you something and this is the worst <laughs> this is the worst place to be when it's lightning I was in the bath 
Oh shit. Were you really? Oh, I was about to get in the bath. I don't know. All I remember is I was like wearing pants and, or I like had no shirt and we had to run. Like we've sprinted over to See, your house can catch on fire. Exactly. And it didn't, but I <laughs> but there sure would have been a plan if it did. There was definitely a plan. And let me tell you, Whatever plan we had in place, it didn't come up when that happened because you were so freaking out. My brother was screaming, we're going to die. I was like, you know, and so just everyone's shocked why I became a therapist. <laughs> I had crippling anxiety up until this point. Like, okay, one part of it was like, oh, like your kids should know safety skills. I'm like caught over, like, it's really amazing your parents did this for us. Like, maybe it wasn't helpful. I, I actually don't know where I stand. You know, I someone know. did a write in that is like a member of a fire, like their house actually caught on fire. And they're like, no, I wish I knew that. Yeah. And that's the thing is I don't, I don't know what the answer is here. Uh -huh. Um, But I think that I, here's what I think. I think teaching your kids that and also teaching them that therapy is an important <laughs> tool is really is really important to couple those two things if you're going to teach them these skills also teach them that therapy is important I had a client once who someone it was a big family someone was a firefighter knew if I can't remember what it was and the dad was like looking at this um lamp that I had and he was like the wires on that are making me really uncomfortable I feel like that's a fire hazard that lamp you just sure you sure should know I threw that fucking lamp out I was like I don't know if this is real or not, but I do know I'll never go near this lamp again. <laughs> I have a big fear of like things catching on fire. Do you remember when our candle exploded? <laughs> Just in the middle of sessions. Yeah. Because it was too hot. Yeah. Candles, I'm sure, are very dangerous. Yeah. They're just so in nice. In general. Yes. Yeah. They are. They are, <laughs> they are so cozy. They're so lovely. So if you need a distress tolerance tool of lighting your <laughs> candle, but it makes you more anxious, that's not helpful. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, can you talk about this in relation to decision making? How to get comfortable or less distressed with the unknown? Hmm. This, um, so once again, and I think this touches on a lot of these questions, is that there's this idea that we are going to get comfortable with something before we proceed. Mm. And the and distress tolerance isn't about making ourselves comfortable. It's about being able to tolerate the distress that comes up. It's being able to manage the distress. That doesn't mean we're swinging so far the other way that we've gone to being comfortable with it. Yeah. So I that's that is a piece that I think is really important to bring up is that we can learn to tolerate the distress with, with that comes with making decisions enough that we're able to proceed with the decision. It doesn't turn into this comfort of the unknown of, oh, now I am so comfortable with the fact that I'm not going to know what's going to happen next. It's okay. I can tolerate the fact that I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. That is scary for me. I understand that that's scary for me. How can I start to manage and tolerate the distress that comes up with that so that I can proceed with the decision? Because when we have so much distress coming with the unknown, it keeps us, we might be frozen. We might not be able to make any decisions. So it's more about tolerating the distress so that we can proceed with a decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I love this question. So I just want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Is there ever too much tolerance? for distress and discomfort. And how do I tell? I love this question because one of the things is if chaos is what you've known your whole life, it's going to feel like home. You will have a loyalty to dysfunction. So if you are simply very used to people making passive aggressive comments towards you, being highly critical of you, when your boss does it, you might not say anything. The question is just because you're comfortable with something, should you put up with it? So I don't know if it's about too much tolerance. If that tolerance went into passivity and not action, I could see that as problematic. Does that make sense? What would you think? Yeah, I completely agree with you. And right, so that would be my question. Like, is it distress tolerance or is it avoidance? Yeah. That's really the question is like, is it, are you actually tolerating this distress or are you shoving it down so that you can avoid the situation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I like this question a lot because yes. I feel this in my bones. Um, I want to do new things, but my body shakes physically and it embarrasses me. Why? Mm. So 
there is a feedback loop happening within your body where you're, you start to have a physical response. You perceive that physical response. When you perceive that physical response, you attach an emotion to it, right? Of my body shaking. This, you know, must mean I'm nervous. And because of this, I'm, everyone is going to perceive me as nervous. I start to feel embarrassed. And because of that, it feeds into my sense of embarrassment. My body starts to shake even more. So here's what I would ask for you. If other people are perceiving you as nervous, right? Or if you start to feel, what's the worry about how, what other people are thinking about you, right? Let's say I say, oh, wow, she's nervous. Okay. What does that mean to you? What does that mean about you? Can you be nervous and still confident? Can you be nervous and still be able to accomplish something? I think asking yourself, what are you coupling with that sense of nervous and embarrassment about your body shaking? That's why people take like beta blockers mm-hmm. because- Or do somatic therapy. <laughs> Or do somatic therapy, right? Um, and the reason why I say I feel this is like when I would give a presentation and my voice would shake because I was nervous because I hate public speaking. Um, and I would start to perceive my voice shaking and everyone staring at me, right? And then I would start to get very hot and then I would perceive the fact that I'm very hot and it would make me even more anxious. It is a complete feedback loop. So being okay with your body's reaction, just saying, okay, I, I can notice that my body's shaking and that's okay, right? My body is trying to function in a way to take care of me, to protect me. It's not something to be embarrassed about. Mm-hmm. It's not something to feel bad about. It's just a natural human reaction. Yeah. You said you feel this in your soul. So that's something you've dealt with? Yeah, yeah, with public speaking. The, the, that's the public speaking one. That's but the I public mean- Yes. Yeah. But you also, um, it does your driving thing. Didn't this used to happen to you driving? Yes. Yes. Um, I used to, yeah, that was a little different. So there, there was a, um, this fear of passing out while I was driving. Yeah. So I used to pass out a ton, um, you know, in very emotional situations with blood, like a passing out happened a lot to me. It happened actually once while I was giving a presentation. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, so it turned into this fear of passing out while I was driving. So I would start to have a physical reaction, right? I would start to feel stress. I would start to get hot. And then I would perceive myself getting hot. Mm-hmm. It would trigger my anxiety. And when my anxiety was triggered, it would lower my blood pressure. Um, and it became this feedback loop. So the way in which I work through that is to say, okay, it is okay that my body is having this reaction, right? To not get anxious about my body's response to say, it's okay that this is happening to me. If I need to pull over, I can pull over. If Mm -hmm. I need to drink some water, I can drink some water. To think, uh, really focus on how do I nurture myself through this? How do I take care of myself through this body reaction? As opposed to saying, I need to not feel this. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with me when I feel this. It's really this kind of acceptance of this is my body's natural reaction and that is okay. And how am I going to take care of myself through this experience? Um, uh, Amazing. So somebody had said, oh wait, um, how to not have hard conversations consume your mind 24 seven until you've actually had it. Something DBT talks about is um, wise mind versus emotional mind. (laughs) So the emotional mind is, I'm going to have this internal conversation 30,000 fucking times, even though it's not going well at all, right? Emotional, emotional impulsivity. Wise mind is, there's nothing I can do to predict or prevent the outcome of this conversation. So what am I doing to take care of myself that is not prep work? We're thinking that we need to prep ourselves to go to fucking war, Right. Um, like, you know, I have to have some conversation. I have to be prepped, like logically, what we have to do is prep emotionally. I'm about to have a hard conversation. So I have to make sure that I get some reading in today, that I listen to some music, that I do some meditation. It's not just about like pre fucking going through this whole logical thing. How do I take care of myself? What's the wise decision? So good. (laughs) Which is like, remember, okay. (laughs) (laughs) What? 
this week Jen called me out so hard when um so we're talking about renting a podcast studio to move forward with recordings because it's fucking pain in the ass do the audio whatever okay I've been so I'm like pushing this idea because I really want it and for some reason I got into my head that Jen did not want this right <laughs> And I have not said once that I don't want it. I'm like, I have no idea. I have no idea why. But for some reason, every time I bring it up, I'm telling all the reasons of why it'll work. And we're at lunch on Friday with a bunch of people. And she's like, why the fuck are you like pre-fighting me? Like at no point have I said no. Like I've already said yes. She was like really gearing up for me to say no. I'm not doing and also I think and I did not realize this, but like after I said it, I think you've I think since we have like found this, you have been saying things like, I think this will be really good. Like you have you are like um you're gearing up like we're in court. I, yeah, why am I like pre-showing evidence of like I'm like coming I'm up so... with this whole thing, right? I'm like so ready for her to reject me about this idea. And she's like, Yeah, like I yeah, that's fine. Down, like, yeah, like it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's like sounds great. <laughs> and then even after she said that, I was like, well, here's why I'm doing yeah, that. She's yeah. like, stop <laughs> talking. It's so funny. <laughs> and then we went to the studio and it was not good. But I'll give you, but I'll give you, listen, I'll give you some credit. I'm, I am one to like throughout yes. our entire usually lives. Usually I have to. Usually you have to, it takes me a while to warm up to think that's how I am. Yeah. I did not do that in this case. So like <laughs> I, I but I was so used to having doing so it from the past it. decade. Yes. I was already prepping. So there's the systemic nature of it, right? Yes. I have adjusted to Jen and I's relationship in a certain yes. way. So when Jen doesn't do her typical thing in our relationship, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> I was already pulling my role. <laughs> but that's good. It's, you know what? We're, gro- we're, we're growing together. Yes. You know, it's beautiful. Right? But you yeah, I'm, David. Yo, I'm so down. Not for that one though. That one didn't. Yeah, look yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. We, then <laughs> yeah, we get no, there, we'll and find... I was like, "Just kidding, never." Mind. Yeah, just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find a different. Yes. it's all good. But I think, but that honestly, that is a really you were prepping in your head for my reaction yes. that mm-hmm. didn't come. Um, before we get to Dear Em and Jen, I'd like to have you answer this question, Jim. Oh, tell me. Someone said, "I don't know how to have hard conversations. I would rather stay quiet and suffer." <laughs> so weird that you would have me answer this question. <laughs> weird. Um, the first thing I would ask this person, is it that you, is it that you don't know how to have hard conversations or you don't want to have hard conversations? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's easy to look at our avoidance as this means I don't know how to do this. I'm not capable of doing this. As opposed to the avoidance being, this is a coping mechanism that I have developed. Our conversations are really hard for me. They're difficult for me to bring up. Um, this person said, I would rather stay quiet and suffer. I'm wondering what, what are the perceived consequences of bringing this up? Like, what is the idea of what this is going to turn into? Because it sounds like if if you're saying, I would rather stay quiet and suffer, the idea of bringing up something difficult sounds like it is so terrifying in your own mind. So terrifying. And so I would say, like, where is that fear coming from? Like, what's the fear? What's going to happen if you bring something up? Start to ask yourself questions of what is this going to turn into? What is my worry about this? So, and I want you to kind of move that language from, I don't know how or to, I'm just really uncomfortable with having hard conversations Mm -hmm. because the fact of the matter is you are capable of it. Everyone is capable of it. It's just very uncomfortable for you. And you might not be used to it. It might not be something that was cultivated for you. Maybe growing up having hard, you were shot down. If you brought up your feelings, you weren't allowed to have your emotions. Um, Other people's emotions were more important than yours. And so it's not about you not knowing how, it's about the fact that you've developed a very specific coping mechanism to hold all of your feelings in. You have the capability and you can work towards it. I would just ask yourself, is that fear that's coming up in your mind, is that really based in reality or is that based in some old stuff for you? Um, Dear Em and Jen, are you ready? Let's do it. Do we do it? Sure. Okay. Here I'm a Jen. About a year ago, I got diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 24. Through this process, I have learned one of my biggest triggers is when someone calls out one of my symptoms 
especially for my husband. For example, if a coworker were to joke about my spaciness, I'm able to shrug it off and say, that's okay. I'm working on it. It's not who I am. And it's the ADHD. But when my husband makes a comment about my messiness, it sends me into a spiral. I'm sure it's due to my lifelong thoughts that my ADHD was a character flaw in myself and not the ADHD. I have tried to explain this to my husband, but I'm convinced non-ADHD people just don't understand. My question is, how can I ask my husband to bring these things up to me without it causing a spiral? Part of me wants to just ask him to never bring it up to avoid the trigger, but at the same time, I can't stand when people don't tell me when I'm doing something wrong just to spare my feelings. Long story short, when he first makes a comment, I think to myself, he's the biggest asshole. He needs to spare my feelings. Doesn't he know I'm already actively seeking help for this? But then as I'm talking myself down, I think he's not an asshole. He has the right to share his frustrations. I need to be less sensitive when he shares them. So how do I know when someone's being an asshole (laughs) or I need to just be able to take some criticism? And it's a good one. I have so many questions for this person. Here's the thing. We would need a lot more context on your relationship, but let's just answer the question this person has asked. Don't forget that you're talking to someone with ADHD and someone with ADD. Okay. (laughs) Um, Your partner does have the right to be frustrated. They do. And even though it is not your fault about these symptoms, it is our responsibility to be aware of them. So when you say, how do I know when someone's being an asshole or I need to just be able to take some criticism? I guess you have to decide, do I give a fuck? So when I say that, everyone's going to be a fucking asshole at some point in the other, right? The question is, does the criticism matter? If a random person walking down the road says some shit about how, oh, this girl's such a space cadet. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Bye, buddy. If my daughter says it, it's different. So the question is, one, who's giving the feedback? And is the feedback coming from a wise mind? We'll use the example of the DBT, right? If my partner is the one who lives with me and is affected by some of my symptoms, shouldn't I consider them? But also how do they give me that feedback and criticism? If my partner is passive aggressive or being highly critical or using a rude tone, all of those are not okay. That is being a jerk. And so you're allowed to say to your partner, hey, of course, how you feel is valid. And I need you to figure out a different way to say it to me. Here are some things that I may be able to hear better. That's exactly the piece that I was going to say is bringing up to them the way in which they express it to you. Yeah. Right. Because there's a huge difference. Your partner saying, hey, you're being a huge mess, right? Get it together. And hey, I don't know if you have noticed, but you have been leaving some stuff around the house. Could you please take the time to pick it up? So it's, he is very much entitled to his feelings. He's very much entitled to express his feelings. However, the way in which he expresses his feelings matter. It does not mean that you are too sensitive and in a partnership, whether you have ADHD, whether you have struggling with something else, whatever communication matters, the way in which you communicate your feelings is really important. So for this, this is for you to have this newly understood diagnosis of ADHD, um, the whole relationship might have to adjust for you to be able to say, Hey, here are some of the symptoms I experience. Um, I understand that they might affect you when you point things out to me, could you express it in this way? It's going to be much easier for me to hear it. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode of shrink chicks. We'll see you back here next week for another session. In the meantime, if you want a question answered or a topic discussed, follow us on Instagram at shrinkchicks. And if you're looking to get connected with a therapist like us to start or continue your therapeutic journey, visit the therapygroup.com. Just fill out a contact form on our website and we will personally match you with one of our amazing therapists. And for all of our therapists and group practice owners out there, we also offer group practice consulting. And if you're looking to support yourself further, and support our show, check out our amazing merch options at shrinkchicks.com slash merch and our Know Yourself, Grow Yourself journal on Amazon. Also, if you'd be so kind, we'd love a rating review and for you to share with a friend or an enemy or a mother-in-law, honestly, whoever needs it, so that we can keep reaching more people on our mission to bring mental health topics to your ears every week. Thanks for being here with us. And don't forget to grow yourself. You got to know yourself. 